what we're going to do is we're going to go over chapter one and I will tell you these PowerPoints aren't the greatest, but the best way to learn is to go after problem after problem and really understand it that way. So this is talking about a term we call the equity method for reporting. And the gist here is consolidated financial statements. When we basically have an entity and then there's a consolidation because they may own a percent of another company. So today we're gonna to just talk about which method do we use, the, what's called a fair value method or an equity method when we're trying to consolidate companies. Now if it's 100% ownership, we do it one way. If it's a 20% ownership, we might do it another way. So we're just gonna talk about, depending on the percent of ownership or control they have in a company, we want to consolidate the companies because <coughs> each entity is supposed to report their financial statements as a whole. So let's just say a company owns a 40% share in another company. Technically, because of their ability to control that company, they truly should be reported as one entity because of the fact that even though there may be two separate businesses, they really are acting as one. Okay. And so we're going to talk about how we go about reporting the entities together and the process. And each chapter just gets into greater detail on unique differences. So basically, we are required through GAAP to consolidate financial statements when investors' ownership exceeds 50% of an organization's outstanding voting stock. So let's just say we have a company and they own 50% of another company's stock. Mm -hmm. We are going to be required to consolidate those financial statements just based on that concept. Okay? Um, now, it's required when Okay, what it's trying to say here is, required when investor, investor ownership exceeds 50% of organization's outstanding stock, except when control does not rest with the majority investor. So even though they might have 50% of the stock, if, if they don't have any control, then it really doesn't matter. Okay. And basically, we're gonna take their various financial statements, bring them together, and treat it as one financial statement, as a single entity. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, um, we're not going to worry about that. Let's just see what this is. International standards. Um, basically, for international standard purposes, if an investor has 20% or more of ownership, it is presumed to have significant influence. If they own less than just 20%, then we just assume they don't have what we call significant influence in the runnings of the company. So we have um, this equity method that we're going to talk about. We have to use this method, which we'll go through what that means compared to the fair value method. We are required to use the equity method when there is um, either a representation on the investee's board of directors, if the investor has the ability to participate in policy making, if there's material intra-entity transactions, so from one company to another, they have significant transactions between the two of them, then we need to consolidate, use the equity method. If managerial personnel go back and forth, if there's a technological dependency between the two, then they're treated as one you know, through the equity method, or based on greater ownership percentages, we're gonna do it too. So, basically, the way it works 
if they aren't able to influence significantly, then generally that means their ownership is less than 20%. Okay, so 20% is the, 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 the mark to say, under 20%, chances are they're not gonna be able to significantly influence the company. If that's the case, the method to consolidate the financial statements is we're gonna use something called fair value or cost, if that's the case. If they own between 20 and 50%, it's presumed they have significant influence, just because of the numbers. And in that case, we'd have to use what we call the equity method or fair value. If it's more than 50%, we've got to consolidate the financial statements. And if there are various variable interests, we've got to consolidate. What we're really going to talk about here is this 20 to 50%, okay? So how do we go about doing this equity method? We are going to learn about some journal entries that we will utilize to bring in that um, subsidiary's portion of ownership into the predominant company. So here's an example. Assume big company owns 20% interest in little company um, and they purchased it on January 1st for 200000 So big company purchased 20% interest in little company for 200000 Little reports net income of 200000 300000 and 400000 respectively in the next three years. So they reported income, but they also paid out dividends. So you know that the investor received dividends. Received dividends. So they're letting us know that the year that Little reported 200,000, they paid out dividends of 50. The year they made 300, they paid out dividends of 100 and ditto with the next one. When they earned income of 400,000 net income, they paid out dividends of 200,000. So how would we go about bringing this information over to the parent company? Big's investment in Little, as determined by market prices, was $235,000, $255,000, and three twenty dollars at the end of the year. Big Company records these journal entries to apply the equity method. So, in this manner, we sometimes look at cost as to, they bought the company 20% for 200,000, but the market prices in the various different years show 235, 255, and 320. So, the first thing we would do is, as it relates to the income, the first year they made income of 200,000, we own 20% of it. So the first thing we would do is show a debit to an asset called investment in little company. And we're gonna take their income times 20% because we get to show that as an investment in the company. So we debit investment in little company and this credit is part of our equity section, okay? Our stockholders section. Okay. The credit is an equity in investee income for 40000 So this is an asset. This is part of the equity section on the parents' books. This shows um, accruing 20% of the income. The next journal entry is going to show that that dividend is coming to us okay so we're going to debit an asset dividend receivable 20 percent of what they paid out but you see here because we are showing that dividend we're then going to reduce our investment in little company 
by the amount of the dividend. Since we're showing the income here of 40, because we received that dividend, we're going to really show the net effect on the income in this company. Because a dividend basically goes against the equity in the company. So we will show here our dividend receivable of 10, and we're going to credit our investment in little company. This shows recording the dividend. Then once we receive the dividend, we debit our cash and credit our receivable. Okay? Now, that's just pretty straightforward how these transactions occur as far as the journal entries to show the income and the dividends using this method. Now what's going to happen is we have to allocate, based on market values, the cost of the investment into this company. We know we paid 200000 to buy 20% of the company, but we're going to need to determine specific assets, their values, so we can assess um, really our share of this company. So in this um, slide, excess cost over book value. Allocate the cost of an equity method investment and compute amortization expense to match revenues recognized from the investment. Fair values of specific investee assets and liabilities can differ from books, which we know. A building is going to be under historical cost. But technically, when we go and purchase 20% in a company, we're not doing that just based on historical costs. We're doing it based on market values. So we've got to go and decipher how these assets are, and liabilities are broken down. And basically, if what we're purchasing it for is greater than the value, fair value, then we're going to um, record it in a certain manner. Let's just go through an example. So, what happens is if we're going to purchase it for greater than what we see the book value, um, we've got to show where that, why, why we paid more for it, okay? Now, um, if we start out in one fashion and we don't have significant influence, but then over the course of a year or two or three, we gain enough ownership that we then do um, have significant influence, then we've got to change the manner in which we've been doing the financial statements. So we have to go back from, at that point when we do um, um, have significant influence, we're going to have to go back and retroactively restate those financial statements so they can be comparable. So how do they determine when that significance? Influence? Yeah. <coughs> because of a change, because someone got on the board of directors, okay. or because they purchased more, more of the sh share. shares or something like exactly. that. Exactly. So that should be the trigger point mm -hmm. of when you would go back and, and you'll change. know. Exactly. And it will say to you that they, at this date, exercise significant influence. So okay. then you'll know at that point in time, we've got to change the ways. Now, there, see, that's why this, I don't like this PowerPoint because it just jumps to all the detail and then really doesn't give you, I'm not going to even bring this up yet. Okay. What I'm going to do is to pause and let's go and work on a problem. So we are going to go, I'm going to pull up Course Smart so you know exactly what we're dealing with.
going here. To restart my browser. Let me see if I can do it through course. Or through it. go to let's go over some problems here I'm going to look at number 13. Okay. Okay. Actually, I'm going to start back here and start with number 6. Okay. Let's just go through them all. So number six, <coughs> on January 1st, Puckett Company paid $1.6 million for 50,000 shares of Harrison's voting common stock, which represents a 40% investment. No allocation to Goodwill or other specific accounts were made. Significant influence over Harrison is achieved by this acquisition, so Puckett applies the equity method. Harrison declared a $2 per share dividend during the year and reported net income of $560,000. We are going to determine what the balance is in the asset account investment in Harrison found on Puckett's financial records as of December 31st. So we know that the investment account is going to increase with their share of the net income and it's going to decrease when dividends are declared. So let's go in here, I'm going to go into Excel. And 
what I'm going to basically do is determine how we're going to show this investment. So we're going to start, how much did they purchase the company for initially? So 1.6 million. 1 million. So we're going to start with the acquisition price because that's part of the investment, $1,600,000. Then the um, – whoopsie, I'm going to get out of there. And that was 40%. It represented 40%. Correct. Correct. So we the $1.6 million is um, our first addition to our equity, our investment account, I should say. It tells us it, they reported net income of 560000 Now we have 40% ownership in that. So we're going to show what we call our equity income at 560000 times 40%, right? And so we will add to our investment account 224000 Then. It told us it paid or declared dividends of two bucks a share and they own 50,000 shares. So we're going to subtract 100,000. So our investment in Harrison as of 1231 is going to be the initial purchase price plus our share of the income, minus the dividends. Make sense? Yep. Okay. So that's number six. Let's look at number seven. Number seven, on January of 2014, Domingo Inc. acquired 20% of the outstanding common stock of Martis Inc. for $700,000. This investment gave Domingo the ability to exercise significant influence over Martis. So it's telling us, which means we have to use the equity method. Martis's assets on that date were recorded at three million nine hundred thousand, with liabilities of nine hundred thousand. So, those book values are three point nine and liabilities of nine hundred thousand. Any excess of cost over book value of the investment was attributed to a patent having a remaining useful life of 10 years. Think about this. When a company creates a patent internally, they cannot show it on their books as an asset. It's an expense, research and development. However, they have this technology. So if a company is coming in and buying it, their book value might show one thing, but they are aware of this intrinsic patent that they're Correct. buying. So we need, when we purchase it, you can only show on your books a patent when you go and purchase someone's patent. Okay. So we're going to need to show a new asset on our books. So the way we're going to do, okay, let me just go back and say, <coughs> it also tells us in March, Martis reported net income of 170000 In 2015, Martis reported net income of 210000 Dividends of 70000 were declared in each of the two years. What is the equity method balance of Domingo's investment in Martis at December 31st of 2015? Okay, so we're just going to pull up our um, Excel. We purchased it for, I believe, 700000 So we're going to start the same way. The acquisition price, 700000 Then 
we're going to show our incomes. Okay? The first year, our share, the income was 170, and our share of it's 20%. And the next year, it was 210, and our share is going to be 20%. So income accruals, or we can call it, let's just keep it the same way, equity income is going to be in 2014, 2014, it was 170,000 at 20%, which is going to be um, 34,000. Yeah. And in 2015, it is 210,000 at 20%. 42,000. 42,000. Okay? Then, Let's just do the things we know about. Let's reduce our dividends. Our dividends were in 2014, 70,000 at 20%, which is minus 14,000. And then in 2015, 70,000 at 20%, which is another 14,000. Now, there's another piece we need to do. The patent, right? The patent piece and the amortization of that patent. Okay. Because we're purchasing that patent and it's an asset and it has a useful life, we're going to need to amortize it and subtract our investment by that amortization each year. How do you know what that is? It'll you tell know, you. Okay. It's that, good. Yeah, I was just like... I don't know. I was like, so you have the 3.9 million of the asset, and then the 90, the 900,000, the liability. Mm -hmm. But how do you figure out what piece of that's related, related to Related to, because we're going to do, well, okay, let me go back here. So we basically, <coughs> they bought it for 700,000. The assets were at three nine, the liabilities were at three. So a net no. asset of three million. Three million. Yeah. Okay? okay? So what we're gonna do is we're going to take um we purchased it. Let me just do this over on the side here. We purchased it for seven hundred thousand, didn't we? Yes. Okay. We um acquired 20% of 3 million. Ah. Okay? So, acquired net assets are going to be okay. 20% of 3 million. 600,000. So, the okay. difference do you see what I'm saying? Why yeah. would we pay more for a company? Right. It's because there is something more in there. Okay. So the excess cost over book that is going to be attributed to the patent is 100000 is 100000 ah. Then from there, patents have limited lives. Okay. Now, it told us that, let me just confirm, that this patent has a remaining life of 10 years. So because we're purchasing this asset, right now it increases the book value or the investment. But each year we have to amortize it, just like we do buildings, you know, and assets. So what we're going to do in our investment account is we need to show that amortization for the years 2014 and the years 2015, don't we? Yes. So we're going to show the amortization of the patent in 2014, it's 10,000, right? And in 2015, 
it's 10,000. So as of December 31st, 2015, our balance in our investment account on our asset section of the balance sheet should show 728,000. So with patents, would you always amortize in like a, a straight line like that? Always. Like always. Okay. Always. Now, a patent is amortized. Trademarks never no, are amortized. No, they're not. Yeah. But for this purpose, mm -hmm. the reason this information affects us is because we have to take that amortization to reduce our asset each year. Right. Okay? Because we, it's, it's, it has a future benefit, but it's only for a period of time. So, number six and number seven are the same concept, except we added a patent okay. in here. Yeah. Okay? Am I going slow enough to help you understand this? Yes. Okay, good. Now let's take it another step. Number eight. Franklin purchases 40% of Johnson Company on January 1st for 500000 Although Franklin did not use it, this acquisition gave Franklin the ability to apply significant influence to Johnson's operating and financial policies. So what he didn't use it, he still has the ability to influence, okay? So a little twist there, but you're learning. It, it doesn't matter. He still is in that position to significantly influence. <coughs> now, Johnson reports assets on that date of 1,400,000 with liabilities of 500,000. So we know net assets here of 900. One building with a seven year remaining life is undervalued on Johnson's books. Because again, yeah, the books show one thing, but we're really buying market value, okay? okay? So it's telling us the market value on one of the buildings is really 140,000 higher than what the book says. Also, Johnson's book value for its trademark with the 10 year remaining life. See, and I, okay, they're, they're not amortized though. Is undervalued by 210,000. During the year, Johnson reports net income of 90,000 while declaring dividends of 30,000. What is the investment in Johnson Company's balance in Franklin's financial records as of December 31st. Okay? Okay. So, you know what? I swear trademarks aren't amortized, but they're telling us we're going to amortize it, and obviously I'm wrong, but I didn't think I was. So let's take this information, and we're going to do the same thing we've done in these previous two questions, except we're adding another piece. Okay? So let's start it the same way. How much the acquisition price is what? 500,000. Is 500,000. And the book value of the assets are 900,000. Do you see it's the one yeah. four minus the 500? Yeah. So we're going to show the um, book value is, and it's 40%, right, right. of 900,000? Which should be 360,000? So excess um, 
of cost over or excess of purchase over book is 140,000, isn't it? Yes. Okay? So you know how we're coming up with that. Now it tells us <coughs> that we know a building was undervalued. So the building was 140,000 greater than what the books show. Right. But we own 40%. Right. So 40% of 140,000 is 56,000. Okay? Now, it tells us that that asset only had a seven year remaining life, okay? So if we take 56,000, divided it by seven years, our depreciation allocation for that building each year is 8,000. Then it told us we had a trademark. And it told us, I just need to confirm it. This is 10 years. 10 years remaining life. So I don't know if that 10 year remaining life. And on the books, whatever the trademark shows on the books, it is undervalued by 210,000. Okay? So we need to take that trademark, the market value minus the book value. 210,000 times our 40%, and that is 84,000. Right. And that's going to be over 10 years, and that is going to be amortized at 8,400 a year. Okay? Make sense? Yes. Okay. So, do you see here, we have excess of purchase to book of 100,000, excuse me, 140,000, okay? I'm going to highlight that part. So how are we allocating this excess? If we take these two figures, they equal 140,000. Yes. Okay. Do. Yeah. It makes it real yeah. straightforward. Right. So we can account for that entire 140,000 excess, and we've done that. We've shown it right here. Yes. Okay? So we know that extra 140,000 is going to be applied to two assets, and we know each year we are going to need to take an allocation one's depreciation, one's amortization of 16400 Make sense? Yes. So, we needed to do all that work just to get to where we can now determine the investment account. So, the investment purchase price was, or I'm going to call it acquisition price, 500 yeah. Now what are we going to do? The equity share of the income yeah. is, we own 40% of it, yeah. and, what was it yeah. and that was 90,000. So we're going to take 40% of 90,000 and add that to our investment account of 36,000, right? Yeah. Then we have to show our dividends declared. 40% of? 30,000. Of 30,000? And that is 9,000 bucks. No, excuse me, 12,000. And we subtract that. Because think of this. The net income increases the investment account. But then when you're issued dividends, that subtracts from our net income because we're receiving it. Do you yes. see what I'm saying? Yes. Now the last piece we need to do here is show our allocations. 
So, or amortization. Amortization of assets over book. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which is over here, this 16.4. 16 Each year, we're going to amortize it 16.4. So our investment in Johnson as of, let me just see, whoops. As of December 31st, should be. 5076. Are you kind of following? Yeah. We're just, it's the same concept over and over again. But they're adding little pieces to it yes. that require us to do some calculations to determine how we amortize. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, Let's look at number nine. <coughs> Evan Company reports net income of 140000 each year and declares an annual cash dividend of 50000 bucks. The company holds net assets of 1,200,000 on January 1st, 2014. On that same day, Shalina purchases 40% of the outstanding stock for 600,000, which gives it the ability to significantly influence Evan. At the purchase date, the excess of Shalina's cost over its proportionate share of Evan's book value was assigned to Goodwill. On December 31st, 2016, what is the investment in Evan Company's balance in Shalina's financial records? Okay, trademarks can be amortized. It's Goodwill that is never okay. amortized. Okay? okay? So, we're gonna do things the exact same. We're gonna do everything the same. Okay. We're gonna follow through the same process to determine we purchased it for 600,000. We are going to take 40% of the 1,200,000 and whatever is excess is gonna be goodwill, okay? So it's not buildings this time, it's not trademarks, it's goodwill. That goodwill will get added to the investment account and we will not be amortizing it. Does that make sense? So Wait, what is goodwill again? Goodwill is, let's say I own a business for 30 years. My assets on the books and really the fair value of my assets are 300000 But I'm going to make you pay 500000 for my business. Why would you pay five hundred if I only show assets of three? Because I have some intrinsic it, benefit. Yeah, could be the, the, name. the name. It, it could okay. be the reputation. Yeah, the reputation. That's it. So yeah. that's why you would pay more than what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. There, There is a true value, but you can't feel it. Or, or you can't physically see it. It's called goodwill. Okay. Okay, so let's look at number nine here. With number nine, they show they purchased it for six hundred thousand, the net assets are one point two million. The subsidiary showed net income of one forty and dividends of fifty, which we know we'll take forty percent of. So Let's go down here. We're going to take the, now I'm, I'm, instead of the acquisition, I'm just going to show purchase price of stock. Okay? okay? I should have done that a couple times, a few back, but I didn't want to start changing names on you. Purchase price of stock is 600000 
the book value, actually, let me, I'm going to go over here. Um, purchase price, stock, 600000 The book value um, of the Evan is 1,200,000 times 40%, right? Mm -hmm. Which is 480,000. So we have excess purchase over book value, which we know is going to be goodwill, right? Yes. And that is 120,000. Make sense? Yes. So that 120,000, we will not amortize. Right now, we're going to look at all goodwill as though it has an indefinite life. We're going to change it down the ch chapters down the way, but let's okay. not do that right now. So, we're going to show our purchase price of 600,000 and this excess purchase of our book value of 120 is already in our 600,000 here. Right. We just don't have to do anything with okay. it. Okay. Now we're going to take our um, 2014 income, which is 140 times 40%, right? Yeah. And our dividend was. 50, 50 times 40 percent which is 20 I'm subtracting then in 2015 our income is 140 times 40 percent again our dividend 50 times 40 percent And then 2016, because it's asking us what is the investment account showing on Shalina's financial statements on December 31st, 2016. Right. Now, if it said on 2000, December of 2014, we would have only taken the income and the dividends for that year. Okay, so 2016 income, 140 times 40%, and 2016 dividends, 100. so our investment in Evan as of December 31st, 2016, should be 708,000. Is that making sense so far? Yes. 